We're in a series called The Why Factor. We learn to ask the question very early in life, and it's, I think it's a healthy thing for us to continue to do so. This morning we're going to talk about why does God call us? Why is a calling, a sense of calling, an important thing in our lives? And we're going to look at a passage of Scripture that I think uh, really uh, provides a lot of useful insight in learning to discern the call of God in our lives. And it is in uh, Luke, the fifth chapter. It says, one day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. And then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water, let down the nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats with so full that they began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. And then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. I think one of the fundamental questions we have to answer in our faith journey is, what is the purpose of faith in our lives? Is it, get, is it to get God to bless what we are doing or for God to lead us in what we are doing? And I think this message helps us figure that out a little bit. We're going to look at some distinctions today, and the first is the difference between a job and a career and the difference between a career and a calling. A job is a set of tasks or responsibilities that have been assigned to you and that you are responsible to complete or to manage. And you can do that at a specific location. A career uh, is a little bit more than just a set of responsibilities. It's kind of a generalized area that you not only continue to grow and learn in, but have some goals up, uh, about. So we often call it a career path. There's, there's a path that you're on. So you may have a job as an accountant, and that means you work in a particular place. But if your career is an accountant, you might do that job in different places, but it's still a career. The idea of calling is something that's a little bit different than either a job or a career, and it has to do with our sense of purpose in life. And here's what I think that it's really helpful for us to know about a calling, and that is that you don't decide your calling. You decide a job and you decide a career. You don't decide a calling. You answer or you don't answer your calling. So it's a very powerful thing. So the question becomes, so do I know what my calling is? Not just where I work in the general area that I have some skills and proficiencies in and, and capabilities in, but do I have a sense of calling as, as to why I'm here and, and how I'm factoring into God's eternal plan? And I think this passage is really useful. So I'd like to look at some things that help us discover and respond to the calling of God in our life. And the first is be aware that your calling is not the same thing as your career. Be aware your calling and your career are not the same thing. Uh, you can be an accountant and continue to be an accountant, but there may be a calling that is beyond just that job or that general vocation. Uh, let's take a look at the scripture this morning, the story. It's, it's really interesting. Is that Jesus was teaching and people were crowding around him to the point that he's backed up against the water now. His feet might even be getting wet uh, in the Western culture where we live, people have a sense of distance that we keep from each other. Every culture, it varies a little bit. In the Middle East, uh, that sense of, of distance between you and another person is much less than it is here. When you go out of our country, you discover in lots of places people stand closer to you than you feel comfortable with. 
And uh, some places I've been, they just, you, you are crammed in around on all sides. So Jesus is getting crowded. And what's interesting is, is that they're there to hear him teach. A lot of people assume that the only reason that people showed up to see Jesus was to get a miracle or see a miracle, and they would tolerate the teaching. But he's, it actually says that they are there to hear him teach the word of God, which had to be a remarkable experience for them. So he keeps getting pressed. He's backed up against the water. He sees a couple of boats there. He sits down in one, and he asks Simon, who would later become known as Peter, just to paddle out a little distance so that he could create some distance between him and the crowd, and he continued his message there. Once he had completed it, he just looked back to Simon, and he said, why don't we just head out into some deep water and let down the nets? Let's go fishing. And Peter responds with uh, some phrases that are just loaded with cues that this is not a great idea. Uh, we do this all the time, right? When we talk to people, we, we want to sound like we're going along, but we want to give them information that will allow them to let us off the hook. So this is what he says. He starts out with, we have worked hard When you say you've been working hard, you're giving a clue, and the clue is, and I'm tired. <laughs> I didn't just work. I didn't do some work. I worked hard. And then he adds another thing. All night, which is not just a reference to how tired he is. While you were sleeping last night, I was working. But he's telling them something else, which is when you do fishing. You don't drop nets in the daytime. The fish can see the net coming and they swim away. You drop nets at night. So he's telling Jesus, I do have some expertise. And then he tells him something else. And we caught nothing. More clues in here. This is not like agriculture. You don't go to the field where everything has been planted. You don't go to the tree where the fruit always is. Fish move, and today they're not here. I know, I worked hard all night and caught nothing. And so he just, he puts this information out there. And Jesus does the most amazing thing. He just looks at him. Like, we're polite people. We would let him off the hook. Oh, I, 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 didn't, I didn't realize it. I thought maybe you had a day off. I, oh, the fish aren't here. That would be a waste of time. Jesus just waits. You should know something about Jesus. He will never apologize for calling you. And he never accepts our excuses or our assessments as to why the timing is not right. He just calls us. And so he just waits. And, and Peter finally surrenders, but he lets it know, the only reason I'm doing this is because you're asking me to. And so they head out into deep water. This is a really interesting season for Peter. He's going to learn a lot from this person that he was just introduced to, and he has watched him teach. And so Simon lets out, he goes out into the deep water, he lets out the nets, and immediately there's such a big catch of fish that not only can his boat not contain it, but when he calls for his partners in business to come and assist him, the two boats are actually at risk of sinking. And that's why I think the second thing is so important. Not only do you need to know that your career and your calling are not the same thing, you need to rethink your definition of faith. Um, I think we often equate faith with a feeling. If we're feeling confident, we. Well, I have faith that that will turn out okay. Uh, if we have some hope, we, we kind of equate that with faith. Often we refer to faith as a belief or a truth that we hold on to or adhere to. And so, well, well, I have faith that, and then we, we talk about some truth that we do believe in. But here's the interesting thing about Simon is that he doesn't think anything is going to happen. He's just told Jesus, I worked hard all night, caught nothing. This is a colossal waste of time.
time. I'm already tired, and now I'm going to be tireder. <laughs> and Jesus just doesn't let him off the hook. And so he does it, and he tells Jesus why. Because you asked me to. That's why I'll do it. It is absolutely amazing that just that, that alone was enough for Peter to participate in the miracle. You know, a lot of times we feel like our prayers are no good because we have feelings of fear or we have thoughts of doubt. And so we think, well, somehow my prayer is contaminated and God can't use it. Or, or we, we don't realize that prayer is an action and the reason we pray is because God tells us to. He doesn't say your feelings have to be just right and, and you have to have perfect uh, thinking when you pray. Uh, we're all going to have doubts at many seasons in our life, but the important thing is that you do what he asks you to do. We, we share our faith. That's an action. We, we gather in rooms like this to worship and, and to listen to God's word, and that's an action. We, we read God's word. That's an action that, that Peter was not disqualified from a miracle because of how he felt. He participated in a miracle because he acted on what Jesus said. He didn't feel good about it at all. I think this is an important thing for us to understand. Apathy and passivity can do as much damage in our lives as any sin we will ever commit. Our lack of action. And, and, and a lot of times we, we will actually use our, our thoughts and our concerns about our feelings. Well, I, I just, you know, I don't feel like my heart is pure. Pray anyway. I don't feel that my motives are pure. Pray anyway. Worship anyway. Read anyway. Because when we do those things, we can participate in what God is doing. Because you say so. Peter didn't think anything was going to happen, but he did it anyway. I've never heard anyone who told me, I am so glad I didn't do what God asked me to do. Whew, I really dodged a bullet there. It almost happened to me. I've never met a person who ignored the direction of God in their life and wound up in a meaningful or significant place. Never come across that person. Avoiding challenging tasks and assignments is not the same thing as pursuing joy. Avoiding conflict is not the same thing as experiencing peace. There's action that we have to take regardless of how we feel. So Simon would have gotten more rest if he just said no to Jesus but he would have missed out on a miracle. And Simon may never have known what the thrill was to discover what the calling is in his life if he didn't pull the oars in a direction other than his desire. But because Jesus said so, he was willing to do it. We cannot experience what God wants in our lives if we only do what we want. It's not how it works. The more excuses we make, the more reasons we will find for settling for less than what God intends. I know we're busy. I know we're tired. I know we're behind schedule. But you should know that God will not wait until we are rested and until we have a lot of free time on our hands before he calls us. Because if he waits for that, it's never going to happen. Now, let's just check. How many parents have we had in the room, do we have in the room right now? How many parents have discovered that once you have a baby, you are tired for the rest of your life. <laughs> it's just how it is. You thought you were tired before, but turns out there's new levels to tired you didn't know about. Uh, one more thing about pursuing and discovering God's calling in our life, and that is allow Jesus to address your fears. This is a really intriguing portion of the story. Simon responded to this miraculous catch of fish just by collapsing to the ground at Jesus' feet. And this is what he says to Jesus, you need to go away from me because I am a sinful person. I don't know what Simon was calculating in the identification of him being a sinful person. Maybe he felt embarrassed that he didn't understand what Jesus was actually doing in the moment. Or, or maybe he felt guilty for the, the thoughts and the feelings that he had had leading into that. Or, or maybe he was just assessing all of his life and the style that had been created 
the patterns of thoughts, the patterns of words. I mean, Peter had a very colorful vocabulary. All of his actions, um, he, didn't think, he didn't think that a person like him was allowed to be around sacred things or near holy people. They needed to be protected from people like him. And so he just says, I'm a sinful person, and uh, I'm not worthy. For your own reputation, for yourself, Jesus, you need, to, you need to walk away. And Jesus does the most amazing thing. He doesn't say your sins are forgiven. That's what I would expect him to do. Because Jesus understood something that Simon didn't. It wasn't his sinfulness that was the problem right now. It was his fear. Don't be afraid. That fear was now an assault against continued obedience. What his feelings and his experience and his exhaustion couldn't do in keeping him from obeying Christ, now fear was paralyzing him. And Jesus, I'm sure Peter thinks, he's just going to find out there is more about me that he doesn't know, and it's not good, and then he's going to walk away. It's just going to be worse. It's just going to be harder, so get out while you can. And lots of people don't realize that what God brings into our world is grace. And I think I'd like to talk a little bit about grace, because there are lots of people who think that grace is just about covering up a fault. It's a weak response to a harsh truth. And what I want you to know is that that is not what grace is. Grace doesn't fail to see what a person has done, but grace is able to see what a person could do. That when Jesus looked at Peter, he didn't just see his past, he saw his potential. You need to know something about our world and our culture. It will define you by your worst moment. Just watch a week of news and watch how they go back in someone's life and find something that they did to someone or someplace and they bring it out and they broadcast it. They, they, they exploit it. They explode it. They, they do everything that, that they can all to bring the person down and to make them less option, less options for their life. And here's what I want you to know. It takes no grace to do that. Our, our culture tends to point very strong fingers at, at religious organizations and say, you're just critical and condemning. Just look at our culture. Go ahead and tweet something when you're 14 years old and when you're 40. Watch what happens when they find out what you said. Because you are done. And they will expose it and they will exploit it. And that's not grace. Grace extends forgiveness because grace sees what you could do, not just what you have done done. That's amazing grace. God sees more than you see when you look in the mirror. If you could see what God would see, you would run to him. You would pull the oars in that direction all night long. Thank God for grace. That's a really good place for an amen. That's where I would put one in. Uh, there's one more fear I think I'd like to just just talk about a little bit before we call it a day here, and that is there are some people that they read this story and, and their takeaway at the end is, is Peter left his, his fishing business and he becomes a follower of Jesus. And there are people who believe this. If I say yes to the calling of God, he's going to put me in a place I don't want to go doing something I don't want to do with people I don't want to be with. If I say yes to God, he's going to put me in a third world nation where I have to eat bugs and sleep with snakes. And every time the wind blows, my hut falls down and my children will get diseases and, 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 and I won't have cable. <laughs> and by the way, people do this about marriage too. If, if, you are, if you are single, there are a lot of people who do not trust God to help them find their 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 marriage partner for life. They believe that there were a lot of people nobody else would take, and if we will say yes to God, he will pawn them off on us. <laughs> Whatever you want. Oh, really? And that's not how it works at all. 
Yeah. There, there's some things you wouldn't know about me. So when I was a little boy, when I say a little boy, a little, the preschool, I would, I would take all my stuffed animals, and I would line them up in rows, and I would get a book. I didn't know if it was a Bible or not, and I'd preach to them. <laughs> it's true. When we finally got siblings, and I was responsible for babysitting them, I would make them sit, and I would preach to them. And then I would give a call to repentance, and I knew what all their sins were. I was the oldest brother. <laughs> and then we would do baptisms, but I wasn't allowed to use real water, so we had to do imaginary baptisms, and I would dip them down into just a hole in the ground instead of air, and just air instead of water. My, my parents walked in the house one time. I don't know why I got this idea. I was just a little kid. A, a record player. Does anybody remember what that is? It's like a CD, only bigger. <laughs> and uh, I, I set it up in the middle of the living room, and I put it on its slowest speed, and I put all the, 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 the stuffed animals around in a circle, and then I stood on top of it and turned it on, and I just preached <laughs> to all of the stuffed animals. They must have thought I was absolutely crazy kid. I'm sure they talked and prayed about me after I went to bed. I, I still wanted a different career, that's for sure. But I had a calling. And here's the thing about our calling is God doesn't always ask us to leave what we're doing. There's lots of examples in Scripture where people stayed in what they were doing but they connected it to a grander purpose. In fact, if you're in life groups, that's, that's kind of the focus for the next lesson. It's really amazing what God can do. There's another way that this fear kind of works in us, and that is we see all of our deficiencies and idiosyncrasies and, and inabilities. We see them more than anybody, and we think that, you know, if I didn't have those things, God could use me, and it's absolutely amazing what God will use in our lives. That the thing that seems to have made other parts of life so hard are the very things that God will use to make life work when you are pursuing the calling that he has on your life. The other th the things that people used to scratch their heads about and look at you about, all of a sudden when you're operating in your calling, you see it's a perfect fit. This is how God has created us to be. You don't decide your calling. You just answer. Yes or no. Let's bow our heads today. Uh, here's what's true. I think God's got a calling for every one of us. I think we all need a purpose that's larger than just a career path or a set of vocational objectives. I think that God knows that a job or a career is never completely enough for us because he's the one who created us for more. So are we open to what he's going to ask of us? Um, there's a passage in Romans 12, and it kind of is a passage where we're being called to surrender this idea. And I'd like to pray that passage over you today. Uh, Father, we need your help. Would you take our everyday, ordinary life, our eating, our working, our walking around and interacting with others, would you help us place that before you like an offering? Would you help us embrace what you want to do in us and through us? Help us not to become so well-adjusted to the culture around us and to the forces that we walk in and around so that we just wind up being a reflection of everything else that's around us. We want to reflect you. For that to happen, you're going to have to change us from the inside out. So we're listening. Capture our attention. We're not too tired. We don't have high opinions of ourselves, but we're willing to listen to you. In Jesus' name.
Amen. Let's all stand together this morning.